you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the Emergency Ultrasound Podcast. My name is Mike Mallon. And I'm still Matt Dawson. And we're going to talk to you today about fluid responsiveness. This is a pretty interesting topic that uh, I've been thinking about a lot recently and doing some research on uh, in an area that I'm, I'm pretty excited to talk to you about today. So fluid responsiveness is the concept that maybe we can evaluate patients in a different way. So instead of just saying, what's their preload, we're sort of asking the question, is their cardiac output going to change with a modification of their preload? And to really hammer that point home, I'm going to bring you back to around second year of medical school. I don't know if you guys remember this graph here, but this is called the Frank Starling curve. And if you remember anything about the Frank Star Starling curve, you should remember that it sort of creates a relationship between cardiac output and preload. So if you look at this particular curve here, you'll notice that there's different colored Frank Starling curves. There's a green curve, which is a well-functioning, well-maintained, uh, really healthy heart that probably exercises a lot and is really good at what it does. And that's, that's the green curve. Whereas, for example, the red curve, which is a little bit lower down on the graph, is uh, probably more of an overweight curve, uh, a less healthy curve, used up, old. Uh, that's not a very good heart, right? So that's a, that's a weak heart. I'm just going to assume that's another Matt you know. Sure. Uh, so basically what you can see here is that, for example, with this red curve, big changes in the x-axis or the preload don't really change your cardiac output much, whereas on the green curve, just a little bit of change in your preload will really increase your cardiac output fairly significantly. And this is the whole concept that I want to bring you back to when we're talking about fluid responsiveness. I want to try to get away from this concept that with these six septic patients that we have in the emergency department that we're just looking at preload because really what we want to know is will modifications in their preload change their cardiac output and that's what we're really going to deep dive in on today. So let's get right to it. <clears throat> There's definitely a a line that we have to walk when we're dealing with these sick patients in the emergency department. So they're septic, they're sick, uh, a lot of them have cardiac dysfunction, and what happens is if we don't give them enough fluid, they're going to continue to be septic, continue to be hypotensive, they're still going to be shocky, they're not perfusing their organs enough, whereas if we just bang them with fluid and, and hit them with too much fluid at once, we're really pushing them into pulmonary edema, we're maybe increasing their risk of ARDS, and we're really overloading our, an already sick heart. Yeah, I remember in residency, working in the emergency department, and uh, especially after the early goal directive therapy came out, everybody felt like we just didn't get enough fluids. They were saying, more, 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 just keep giving them fluids, keep giving them fluids. And that was kind of pounded into my head until I actually went to the ICU, and I saw these intensivists getting really frustrated with getting these patients up from the department who have just been flooded, and they just have a horrible time getting all the fluid off of their lungs and dealing with all of the mess that we've caused just by blindly flogging these patients with fluid. So I, I, I take an approach now where I try to give them exactly the right amount of fluid, Mike. I think that's a great approach. I actually gave someone a 781 milliliter bolus the other day because that was the that was the perfect amount of fluid. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to just get it perfect. So that's what I try to do. I mean, I've, and I've got my way to do that. I'm, I'm interested to hear in how exactly you... Uh, figure out what the perfect amount is. We're obviously being a little ridiculous here. The, the concept that we're going to get it to the T is, is basically retarded, but what we're going to try to do is try to make some sense out of how much fluid, when do we give it, when do we stop giving it, and hopefully this fluid responsiveness, responsiveness lecture will get us there. So here's an example case. So this is a 73-year-old lady. She's got a history of heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, comes in altered. Turns out she's got urosepsis. She's hypotensive, febrile, tachycardic. You give her two liters of fluid, right? Why? Because that's what we do. We give two liters of fluid and see if they respond. You want to know if it's going to be really severe septic shock or are they just in sepsis that responds quickly to fluid. So two liters of fluid given. You repeat some um, some vital signs. Her blood pressure is still low. It's 80 over 40. She She's still tachycardic. So now, now what do you do, Matt? What's what's next for this lady? Mm, she's not intubated yet, right? She's not intubated. So just keep giving her fluids. <laughs> keep giving her fluids until you intubate her. Is that yeah, what your that's what your goal is? Yeah, you know, and I've and I'm I'm saying that joking, of course, but I remember hearing that uh, in the emergency department from some attendings before, where 
Uh, the patient's still hypotensive. They said, just keep giving them fluids. We can intubate them. We can, we can breathe for them. Don't worry about it. So, um, but, and I, that kind of st- stuck with me a little bit. But I'm, <laughs> So I'm kind of excited to know that we can actually predict a little bit if they need more fluid or not. So I guess maybe keep giving them fluids until you intubate them is probably not the standard of care out there right now, but I think this probably is. And this is this is that graph that we often see with rivers, right? So this is early goal-directed therapy, and basically what happens is you give that initial fluid bolus, and you, uh, you see where the patient is, and if they're still hypotensive, you drop in a central line, you measure a CVP, and then you continue fluid administration until you get their CVP to a certain number. So that's, that's sort of, that's where we are right now. This is the typical invasive manner in which we treat septic patients in the emergency department. And I feel like there's got to be a better way. Uh, I feel like instead of just following this number, the CVP value, which has questionable validity, we probably can figure out, you know, are they really going to respond to this third liter? Are they going to do better? Or can I just go ahead and pull the trigger on the pressors? So we're going to talk today about the differences between static measures and dynamic measures of fluid responsiveness. And I'm not trying to confuse you guys with terms. I just want to break it down because I think it does make some sense uh, to really understand what the difference between a static and a dynamic measure of fluid responsiveness is. So we're going to talk first about CVP, which is basically sort of assumed to be our right atrial pressure. We're going to talk about why it sucks. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the dynamic measures. I want to talk about the IVC and the respiratory variation of the IVC. And I want to talk about passive leg raise because this is, this is sort of a new area to me at least, something that I don't see getting done in the emergency department and a potential area for a lot of education where we can really hopefully make a difference in these patients. So I got to admit, I've been drinking a little bit of the CVP haterade, and I think a lot of people are drinking it these days. So the problem with CVP is that it's a single point in time. All we really know is what is the preload to the right side of the heart. And not only does that not tell me really much about how the heart functions, or even whether the heart's going to improve its function based on increasing that preload, it, it just doesn't really give me any information. So a CVP is basically the filling pressure to the, to the right atrium, and it's not really an accurate assessment of fluid responsiveness. So if I'm just looking at one central point on this graph, I can't tell you whether I'm on the green line, the yellow line, or the red line of the Frank Starling curve. So another problem with the CVP is the fact that about 60% of all the patients we see in the emergency department with sepsis are going to end up having cardiac dysfunction. So with that cardiac dysfunction, I'm expecting some right ventricular dysfunction. So that CVP really might be inappropriately elevated, and it might be way off the curve and way different than what I'm expect how different than how I'm expecting the patient to respond. So this is just another reason that a static point really tells you jack about the patient. One of the main reasons I've been drinking all the Haterade is because of this article that came out in Chest. This article was released in 2008, and it was a review. 24 studies and 803 patients. They basically compared CVP to fluid responsiveness of the patient. And what they found was that patients that were fluid responders had a CVP of 8.7, and patients that were non-responders had a CVP of 9.7. And that is not significant. You can see that there's overlap between that plus or minus value on each one of those patients. So this is basically telling me, this paper tells me that CVP only tells me what the preload to the heart is and does not tell me anything about how the heart's going to respond to a fluid bolus. So I don't know if their cardiac output's going to increase. I don't know if I should expect their blood pressure to increase. I know nothing. Okay, so I've got to stop here and make a public apology. You know, I've taught a lot of people that IVC diameter and size makes a difference and actually matters. But after reading this article, I was very disturbed. I initially thought about trying to contact all the people who have taught this and infected with this thought. But then what came to mind immediately was, you know those cards at the health department that they'll give out if you test positive for certain diseases that you can send to your partners that, hey, you may want to get checked out. Uh, Sorry about that. Well, I thought me trying to contact everybody would be similar to... Wilt Chamberlain trying to send those cards out. It just isn't feasible. So instead, I'm making a public apology. If I infected you with this thought, I'm very sorry. Get your knowledge checked. Read this article. Again, very sorry. So now I 
I am talking a lot of smack about the CVP, and I think I need to be a little bit honest here. We still got to fill the tank, right? Preload's important in the sense that we have to make sure that it's high enough. Like, if the CVP is 2, if the CVP is 4, you know, clearly we don't need to do anything else. The patient needs fluid. They might need fluid and pressors. I'm not sure about that, but they definitely still need more fluid. Uh, and we have to make sure that we're filling the tank. There was an interesting article released... Um, it was released in the Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2010, and they looked at the IVC collapsibility and relating that to CVP. And this is this is what a lot of the articles that I've seen from the emergency department talk about. They talk about relating our IVC changes to CVP, which is helpful if you believe that CVP is worth something. The reason I like this one is because they basically broke it down to a very simple terms, and they said basically a change in the IVC of greater than 50% during respiration is pretty accurately uh, descriptive of a CVP of less than 8. And that's like 91% sensitivity, 91% specificity. And that's meaningful to me in the sense that if even if I'm not putting a central line in these patients, if I look at that IVC and it collapses more than 50%, I know their CVP is pretty low. So I think the only way, the only thing I take away from my CVP value at the end of this is if it's really low, they need fluid. And that's about it. Anything more than that, and I'm not really comfortable making decisions about what needs to happen next for the patient. So you're fine with the statement if it collapses more than 50% with respiration, they do need fluid. I am, yeah. And I think we'll, I want to get to that a little bit more later because I'm going to go over some algorithms that I've kind of thrown together uh, to try to explain how we should go about doing all this. And so you're saying here that CVP isn't worthless if it's an extreme. So if it's really low or really high, then great, we can use it on those easy patients. It's just the ones that are in the middle where we want to get more complex and more sophisticated. Exactly. I feel like what we shouldn't be doing is putting in a central line and measuring a CVP of 7 and saying the answer is more fluid because we have no clue. Gotcha. But if it's obvious, if the CVP is 1, if it's 2, I think then we know what to do. So let's talk a little bit about dynamic variables. So a dynamic variable basically is a variable that measures the response of the heart to some sort of change in pressure. So for example, if we're measuring these variables during alterations of the breathing cycle or with a passive leg raise, we're changing somehow the, the preload to the heart and seeing how the heart responds to it. Examples of these are the IVC during respiratory variation and the passive leg raise test, which we're going to talk about. So this really gives us a little bit more understanding about where the heart is sitting on that Frank Starling curve. So, IVC variation, is it the answer? Well, there's actually been some studies that show that IVC and SVC respiratory variation are pretty helpful. The problem is they're really only in mechanically ventilated patients, and there hasn't been much done in spontaneous breathing patients that really I can hang my hat on. Uh, so the the reports are sort of muddy in the water, and let's let's dive into this a little bit. There's one study that came out, and this was released in Intensive Care Medicine in 2004, and I really like this study. They look at something called the IVC Distensibility Index, which is sort of weird terminology. The reason they call it that is because these patients are mechanically ventilated, so instead of compressing with respiration, the IVC is distending because I'm giving the patient a positive breath, right? I'm increasing intrathoracic pressure, so therefore the IVC is getting larger as opposed to and getting smaller during the inspiratory cycle. So what they did is they said, okay, big IVC minus little IVC divided by little IVC, if that's greater than 18%, your sensitivity is 90%, your specificity is 100%, that those patients are going to be fluid responsive. And that's a pretty good study, and the numbers are pretty decent in this study. The, the, the N was not huge. It was a fairly small number of patients, uh, but it was pretty legitimate, and, and I, think I, can, I think I can hang my hat on this. I think in mechanically ventilated patients, the IVC is probably enough. So let's talk about how to do it real quick. So to measure the IVC, I'm going to use the subcostal window. I'm going to use the abdominal probe, so we've got the curvilinear probe here. And I'm putting the probe just under the xiphoid in a longitudinal axis with the probe marker pointed towards the patient's head. I'm going to slide the probe about two centimeters to the patient's right, just two centimeters of midline, and I'm going to look at the IVC. And I can look at it, just eyeball it, see if it's collapsing greater than 50%, or I can put in mode on it and really do my measurements and really calculate out that distensibility index. 
So here's an example of an IVC. So we're looking at the IVC in long axis here. You can see it dropping into the right atrium. We're actually zoomed into the IVC on this image just to give it give you a good view of it. And the really the important part of the IVC is right there, just just distal to the hepatic vein. So right uh, right in this area right here. So just distal to the that first hepatic vein that, that comes off the IVC. Here's an, another example of an IVC, and we're just we're watching this one sort of right next, uh, right right under the heart. So another long axis view, uh, looking at the IVC. And then here's a, a different IVC. This one's clearly larger. There's hardly any respiratory variation. So this is a good example of a big dilated IVC and somebody that's got a lot of fluid on board, or at least uh, a lot of backup from fluid from the right heart. But you can you can tell that like. If you think about this, Matt, this IVC is huge, so I can make two assumptions here. I could assume that either the patient's volume status is way up, or I can assume there's something really wrong with the right side of their heart. This patient could have a PE, they could have right ventricular failure, they could have pulmonary hypertension. There's lots of reasons why the IVC could be big, and that's what sort of concerns me about using this as a determinant for fluid responsiveness. But I think in the, pa in the patients who have fairly decent cardiac function, I think we're probably okay doing this. So here you can put in mode right there on the IVC and look at the respiratory variation on that IVC. And, and here we see the, the diameter change from 3.95 centimeters to 3.35 centimeters, so hardly any change at all. Definitely would not be greater than 18%. This person would not fall in that criteria for meeting fluid. So now I want to talk a little bit about the passive leg raise test. And this is a pretty interesting test, and if for no other reason, because you look awesome holding pa patient's legs up in the emergency department. So uh, basically what we do is we give the most awesome fluid bolus ever because we can take it back if it doesn't work. So by picking the patient's legs up and holding them to 30 degrees, I'm basically giving them 500 cc's to a liter of blood from their legs. So dependent fluid in their legs, now in their central circulation, voila, fluid bolus, I see how the heart gets affected. If it doesn't help, I take it away by dropping their legs back down. It's totally awesome. It's the, the coolest thing since sliced bread, in my opinion. Uh, and if for no other reason that you look awesome doing it. So it's often been performed in ICUs in the past. A lot of the times with invasive monitoring, you can do it when you've got an art line in place, when you've got a Swan, Swan Gans catheter in place, and actually see how the heart responds. But the newer studies that are coming out are suggesting that maybe we can use echocardiography as a means to determine whether people respond to this passive leg raise or not. And that's what I wanna dive into here. So passive leg raise testing is the only validated assessment of volume responsiveness in spontaneously breathing patients. So IVC is not validated. Uh, the size of your left heart is not validated. Really, the only things that have been validated in spontaneously breathing patients are the passive leg raise test. All right, so here's how we do it. So first, we're going to start off with the patient in the semi-recumbent position, so head of the bed, 30 to 45 degrees. I'm going to measure the cardiac output with the patient in that position, and that's my baseline. Then I'm gonna lower the head of their bed. I'm gonna raise their legs up to 45 degrees and I'm gonna wait there for a minute or two so all the blood in their legs can drain down into their systemic circulation. Then I'm gonna repeat my cardiac output measurement. That's my passive leg raise cardiac output. If the cardiac output increases by 10%, bam, they're fluid responsive. Okay, so let's knock this out. And I know there's a lot of scary numbers and weird terminology in here, but I really feel like after maybe five times of, of giving this a go, you'll be able to knock this out in less than five minutes on your patients. So let's, let's talk about it here. So stroke volume is basically the distance times an area, and cardiac output is stroke volume times the heart rate. So if I take a distance, and I assume the distance is my left ventricular outflow tract VTI, which sounds scary, but is, is really easy to find. It's basically the distance that a column of blood travels through your aortic valve. And if I multiply that distance times an area, which is just the area or the area of a circle, which is your left ventricular outflow tract, then I get my stroke volume. I then multiply whatever my stroke volume is, volume is times a heart rate, and voila, I've got cardiac output. So how do you find the left ventricular outflow tract area? The way you do it is you start off in the parasternal long axis view, and you only need to do this once on each patient because your LVOT diameter does not change no matter what your preload is or anything else for that matter. 
And so we get the parasonal long axis window, which is basically probe, mark, probe in the third to fourth intercostal space, probe marker towards the right shoulder. And when we do that, we get this diagram here, which shows basically the parasonal long axis window. And I'm looking at the left ventricular outflow tract here right before it uh, goes through the aorta. And then I'm going to measure just under the aortic valve leaflets at the aortic annulus, which is right there. And that diameter is my left ventricular outflow tract diameter, which is basically what I'm going to use to find the radius for my equation. So here's an example of a parasonal long axis window. And you can see here, this is a normal functioning heart. You can see the aortic valve opening there in systole. So it's that mid-systolic ejection period is where I'm going to measure that LVOT diameter. And here, we're in the mid-systolic ejection period. I'm going to measure right there, right in between those two uh, aortic valve leaflets, just where the aortic valve leaflets insert there into the left ventricular outflow, tr outflow tract, and that's called the aortic annulus. Here's an example of measuring the, the LVOT diameter, and here we've measured the diameter to be 2.14 centimeters. All right, so now we've got the diameter, so that can give us our area. Now we've got to find that distance part of the equation, and that's the left ventricular outflow tract VTI. VTI stands for velocity time integral. And the velocity time integral is basically just sort of the area under the curve of all the red blood cells that are flying through the aortic valve, right? So what we do is we get an apical window. I'm going to put the probe at the apex of the heart, and I'm going to get either a five-chamber a five window or an apical long axis. And to do that, all you really have to do is just get that, ap that apical four-chamber window, and it's just small twists of the probe that are going to open up that left ventricular outflow tract uh, or switch you over to the apical long axis. So typically, uh, what I do is with the apical four-chamber view, um, I take the probe and I just sort of flatten it down just a little bit more so that I'm getting a little bit more of an anterior view of the heart. And when I get that anterior view, I bring in the aortic valve. And that doesn't really require much of a twist, just mostly a flattening of the probe. And that gives you this image that we have down here in the bottom left, which is sort of an apical five-chamber where I can at least see that, uh, that uh, aortic uh, outflow tract or that left ventricular outflow tract there which is right here. So this is the area that I'm interested in right there. Once I find that area, then I basically hit the PW button, which is the pulse wave button, and I'm going to put the gate right in the, in the left ventricular outflow tract, and that's where I'm going to measure my VTI. Alternatively, if I'm not really finding the apical five chamber, I can find the uh, apical long axis window. So to do that, I get my apical four chamber, just like I normally would, and I basically just rotate my probe about 90 degrees or so from where it would typically be. So typically in the four chamber, your probe uh, marker is pointed towards the patient's axilla or maybe towards the bed. So if I rotate it about 90 degrees up towards their head, uh, then I'll typically get a apical long axis window, and this is an example of the apical long axis window where we're looking at the left ventricle here, the left atrium here, and then here's that left ventricular outflow tract. So this is where all the blood is going during our systolic ejection period. It's going through that aortic valve right there, and here's where I'd put my pulse wave Doppler. So an example of that, if we stop that image, you can see that now we have the uh, pulse wave Doppler gate right in the left ventricular outflow tract area, and this is where we measure the VTI. So gosh, let's do it already. Let's measure the VTI. Here we are right here. We've actually measured uh, the VTI, which is basically just outlining that ejection period. So each one of these little uh, daggers, downward daggers of, uh, of blood flow, is the blood cells shooting through the left ventricular outflow tract uh, wherever that gate is uh, during the ejection period. And you can see the blood cells have a different velocity throughout the ejection period. So by measuring the integral of, um, of the, of the uh, ejection period, we're getting the distance that a column of blood travels which e with each ejection. Sounds ridiculous, but basically it gives you that VTI. And in this particular, this particular case, the VTI is 23.3 centimeters. So that's basically how far that column of blood would travel if it just got one shot uh, of the left ventricle, which is pretty far. It's like all the way down to your, I don't know, 
abdominal aorta or something. I don't know. All right, so now we got all that. We've got our LVO, LVOT VTI, which is our distance, and we got our area, or at least we have our diameter of our LVOT, which we can convert to our radius and get our area. Okay, Mike, so let me see if I understand all this. First off, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. I've got that. That makes sense to me. That's the total amount of blood the heart is pumping out per time. Now, stroke volume is what we're going to be measuring. Heart rate is pretty easy to get. I think I can measure our heart rate. So stroke volume, a volume is the distance times the area. I measured the area looking at the LVOT and then the distance, the integral of a velocity is a distance. So we take the integral of the velocity of the blood going out that LVOT and that gives us the distance, right? Yes. So, so th that makes sense. That's math. I think I can uh, understand that. However, it seems like there's a lot of buttons to push and places to place my hands, and you kind of went over them. But could you right now actually demonstrate all the steps and all the buttons on a machine for us? Sure. Let's do it right now. All right. Great. Okay. Hey, so this is Mike Mallon. This is uh, Val Kilmer, who's uh, come with us today uh, to help out with this procedure. So first I'm going to start off by showing you how to put the information in the machine itself. So here I've just put in patient ID, example cardiac output. Uh, of course, our patient's name is Val Kilmer. And then the only thing I really want to add in here is that we're going to put in the patient's heart rate. So we're going to say for uh, argument's sake that his heart rate right now is 65, although normally I'd want to look at the monitor. And then once I've got that all in there, I'm just going to go ahead and start with my exam here. So we're going to do a ca adult cardiac mode, and that tells the machine that we're going to actually do some measurements using the cardiac mode. So if you set it for endo endocavitary, I'm leaving. <laughs> so we'll do the endocavitary example in a minute. Uh, first to start, we're going to uh, we're going to start here with the apical long axis view. So to perform this view, I'm going to put the probe right here in the patient's third to fourth intercostal space. So we've got the probe marker pointed towards the patient's right shoulder. So here, let's take a look at the screen, and this is what we're looking at. And I pretty much get this view almost instantaneously. I might have to twist the probe a little bit to the right or left in order to get it, but here we have it right now. And I'm going to go ahead and freeze this window. And what I want to do is I want to find that point when the two aortic valve leaflets are completely open. So here you can see they're closed by that white line right there. Here we go into systole. And as we go into systole, we can see that the two leaflets are open, and you can see the leaflet right there. See that little, that little dash of white. So now I'm going to hit the measure button, and after I hit the measure button, I'm going to go over and choose left ventricular outflow tract diameter. Okay. Now remember, this is to measure the cardiac output, so I need to know the area of the LVOT, and that's measured by getting the diameter. So here I'm going to measure that diameter in systole, and I found that diameter to be 2.3 centimeters. Okay. So here, that's our LVOT diameter. So that's all I need in this view. So for the next view, I'm going to need the patient's LVOT VTI. And to get that, I'm going to find my apical four-chamber view. So I started just under the patient's uh, nipple is a good place to start. I've got the pro marker pointed towards the patient's axilla. And I'm just going to go ahead and try to find that four-chamber view. So here we see on the screen, here we've got sort of the four-chamber view. This is the right ventricle, the left ventricle, the right atrium, and the left atrium. Now if you watch the probe, what I'm going to do is just basically rotate the probe about 90 degrees so that it's now pointing back towards his right shoulder. And when I do that, if you look again at the screen here, you'll see what's called the apical long axis. And that's basically the same view as we just had a minute ago when we were measuring the LVOT, but now we're looking at it from the apex. And what I'm going to do is measure the velocity of the blood cells going through this left ventricular outflow tract. So here I'm going to hit pulse wave, put the pulse wave gate right, just proximal, just apical to that aortic valve, and I'm going to hit pulse wave again. So now what we have is the velocity of blood cells as they're going through the left ventricular outflow tract. I'm going to hit measure again, go over here to, in, on this particular machine, the LVOT VTI is under aorta. I choose LVOT VTI, manual measurement. And what I'm going to do is I'm just basically going to trace that VTI right here. And you can see I'm just tracing it with the trackball. 
and once we have that traced, I hit set again, and it tells me the LVO VTI is 18.84 centimeters. So now I could just use my calculator and say the VTI is 18.84 centimeters, the LVOT diameter is 2.3 centimeters, and I could pretty much figure out my cardiac output or my stroke volume. In this case, I'm just going to hit report, and it's going to do all those measurements for me. So LVOT diameter, 2.3 centimeters. LVOT VTI 18.84, which gives me a stroke volume of 79.92 mils. And voila, there's your stroke volume. Multiply that by 65 and you've got your cardiac output. <laughs> Thanks. Now for the endocavitary probe. good enough at ultrasound that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation get out there ultrasound some hearts some lungs some ivcs let us know how you feel about it